Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Cybersecurity Matters Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dominic Vogel, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Christian Redshaw. Christian, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. I know who the guest is. I'm excited to bring her on. <laughs> we have, uh, I've been listening to her other podcasts and reading all of her stuff and learning about her story. Uh, she's also the author of a book, which we can get into. Once we get going, yes. who is the guest? Who is, that? <laughs> who is this mystery guest that Christian knows? It is Kara Golden. Uh, we're really, really excited to have her on the show. She'll be talking about her, her journey and how she uh, uh, started up uh, uh, Hint, uh, the um, uh, beverage, beverage company. company. Um, we're really excited to hear her story, uh, as well as talking about her book, Undaunted. Uh, so Christian and I will take a momentary pause here. We'll bring Kara on, and we're looking forward to what's going to be a really great conversation. Well, let's do it. Kara, thank you so much for joining us today on the Cybersecurity Matters podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know, I've been I'm really been really excited um, uh, to have you on the show. You know, as as you know, I'm a big fan of yours. I've been following you on LinkedIn for for quite some time. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could just start with giving our listeners and viewers just a high level, I guess maybe overview of the highlights of of, of your career journey to date. <laughs> highlights. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so you know, I started out in media. And, and print. I worked for a late stage startup back in the early 90s called CNN uh, when it was uh, Ted Turner was still running around the office and saying the world needs to have the same access to news. And uh, so that was probably my first taste of, of the startup world. And uh, I moved to Silicon Valley with, I was engaged. My husband wanted to get into technology law. Everybody said, go West. We were living in New York at the time. And when I got out to the Bay Area, the person that sort of registered in my mind being associated with the Bay Area was a guy named Steve Jobs. And so I swung for the fences, tried to figure out how I could get a job at Apple. And uh, while I was looking for how to get a job at Apple, I also realized that Cupertino was 100 miles away from San Francisco. And I thought, uh, you know, careful what I wish for, uh, for a commute. And instead, I found a little startup that was incubated inside of Apple was a Steve Jobs idea that was taking shopping, uh, shopping partners and putting them on a disk to make basically graphics load onto a computer, uh, or at least the perception load onto the computer faster. We were in a time when there was dial up service and people were fighting with their brother, uh, you know, they were on a chat room and they somebody picked up the phone and it got disconnected. Uh, and so anyway, I ended up getting a, a job with this little startup called Two Market. Uh, it was five guys, not in a garage, but pretty close in an office that were trying to kind of change the world and disrupt the world. Uh, this is 1995. And one of our investors was a company called America Online. I'd never heard of America Online, but soon they acquired us and asked me to run a channel called Shopping. So. Uh, I grew this channel shopping uh, with lots of partners, um, people like L.L. Bean and J. Crew and uh, lots of, uh, we call them catalogers, um, even though some of them weren't. It was really, you know, the early days of what is direct to consumer uh, and did that for seven years. It was a billion dollars in revenue to America Online when I left. I mostly left because I was living in San Francisco and I was never home. I was on the plane constantly. Uh, America Online was based in Virginia and I was traveling to all of my various retail accounts. And so that's when I, I had young kids. I had a third one on the way and I thought I really want to spend time being a parent and enjoying my family a little bit and figuring out what I want to do. There were lots of tech companies in Silicon Valley and San Francisco, and I thought maybe I could get some kind of role there. Uh, while I was looking, that's when I really stumbled upon this interest that I had when it was sparked really by feeding my own kids and start then started to look at ingredients. And, you know, this was probably like 18 and a half years ago now, um, when I was really being careful about what I was putting into their bodies and kind of looking at things like sugar and how even sugar was added to uh, formula, for example, for babies, all of these things were just 
magnified at this point in my life. And that's when I thought one day when I looked down at my Diet Coke can and I saw these ingredients that I just hadn't paid attention to. And the reason I hadn't paid attention to was because the word diet was on the can. I assumed diet meant health and that I knew that sugar should be used in moderation. Uh, maybe it was bad, right? It was all these things went through my head, but I never thought that about diet, but because it had so many ingredients and I had sort of rules for my own kids, I thought I'm going to, see what I can do to see if this really is good for me. And so I did a little test. And after two and a half weeks, I realized after I gave up the diet soda, Diet Coke in particular, the uh, I lost over 20 pounds, 24 pounds. My skin cleared up. I had developed terrible adult acne over the course of uh, the last few years, thinking that it was something I was putting on my skin, not what I was putting into my body. And, uh, and you know, overall, I, I really felt better. I felt clearer not having this chemical in, in my body for which I had been drinking for so many years. I still didn't actually think about myself as an entrepreneur, even though I had worked for incredible entrepreneurs and definitely disruptors, people who were starting categories and not afraid to sort of move forward and in, in some direction. But I, I assumed I was a tech executive. And that's what I would end up doing. But my curiosity was so excited by what I was seeing and somewhat frustrated too, frustrated mostly for the consumer, which had always been where my head was on the other side of the table, thinking about consumers. And I thought there are a lot of people out there like me that probably think that diet is better for them, that uh, you know the diet industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. So maybe if I actually shared what I was doing in my kitchen to get me to drink water, which was slicing a fruit and throwing it in the water. And maybe if I took that product to this brand new store that opened in San Francisco, close to my house called Whole Foods, maybe I could get other people to realize that it's possible to have a great tasting drink that doesn't have sweeteners in it. Little did I know that this concept that I dreamt up in my kitchen was not only developing a brand new company and a new product, but an entirely new category. And something I talk about in my book is that, you know, sometimes if you think too far about the end, you'll never get past the beginning because it's so daunting, right? And instead, what you have to do is just appreciate the journey, no matter whether you're a cybersecurity executive or you're, everybody's got problems, right, that you're trying to solve. And the word impossible was something that, frankly, in the tech industry, we just never really used. Uh, it, was, it was more, I would hear people say that it hasn't been done. But when I walked into the CPG industry and the beverage industry in particular, I kept hearing that's impossible, that's impossible. And for me, I think growing up in a, in a house where I felt like I always had to negotiate the last of five kids for everything in my life, uh, when people said no or, uh, or, you know, that's impossible, I, that to me just set a challenge. And so that was the beginnings of Hint uh, 16 and a half years ago. Uh, the company is now over 230 million in sales. Um, it's, uh, you know, started as a company that was really started as a mission and still today is helping people actually realize that you can have a great tasting product without sweeteners. Uh, I'll say one last thing that, you know, when, when you talk about the mission, I never really thought about our company 17 years ago, we didn't talk about mission-based companies. But I think that what I realized early on was that I never, I never thought about myself as an entrepreneur. I supported entrepreneurs and I saw some really impossible things that ended up occurring. So I'm lucky in that way. But I also realized that 
I really understood the consumer because I was a consumer. And that if I could go do something that could actually change health for the better, then that's just awesome. Like that's my legacy. And so when you lead with something that actually helps people uh, versus I didn't think, okay, I'm going to go start the next Red Bull. I mean, for me, it was really a much bigger proposition and uh, which takes time. You know, it takes time to to do that kind of, you know, big idea and big initiative. Tara, that, that's such an, uh, just, I mean, just, just hang on every word there. I mean, it's such an interesting and engaging story, you know, and your, your narrative is just so incredible and incredibly inspirational. And um, your, your book on Daunted, I, I just want to ask you a, a question on that, right? And to open it up to Christian here. Um, um, and thank you for the copy of the book, by the way. That was, um, it was just a fantastic, fantastic read. Um, I'm wondering if you could share with our listeners and, and viewers, what does Undaunted mean? You know, and, and, and again, based on what you were saying in, in, in earlier, I think I, I know, but how could you best sum that up to, to, to someone? I think people think that entrepreneurs or people who do crazy things are fearless risk takers, that they never have fears. They, you know, just snap their fingers and success happens. Nobody remembers the failures along the way, the challenges along the way. It's interesting. I didn't write this book to, uh, to really be the only one that shows that some of the failures along the way, but it ends up that it, it, that people aren't used to hearing about founders, CEOs, and some of their failures, especially when people, uh, you know, were running companies, right? Like I, that is that is something that. I think more people need to hear. And that was really my goal that I think that I've never viewed myself as a, as a fearless risk taker. I've actually had a lot of fears and I share my fears with people primarily because I think that it's uh, in many ways, um, they're, you know, therapy for me to be able to share. I'm really afraid of that, but I'm going to go take it on. And when you actually like, call those things out, when you live undaunted, when you tell people that you're going to go out and do something that is really scary, you not only show people how real you are, how authentic you are, but you also help them to go out and face their own fears. And as, as you know, you've read the book, I mean, there's stories of personal fears, there's uh, business fears, they may not be other people's fears. Uh, there are things that I went through that I didn't see around the corner that they were coming. And, you know, it's a story of tackling things, figuring out how not to uh, become so daunted, uh, frozen, um, complacent. Um, so I think that that was really my goal in, in getting the story out there. Thank you so much for sharing, Kara. I, you know, I think as a business owner, entrepreneur, um, one of the things that maybe we struggle with is handling pressure at different times, uh, unexpected pressure, because we've never been in these situations before. Um, can you talk about what kind of pressures you faced along the way on your entrepreneurial journey, particularly with Hint, and what lessons you learned and how you overcame those particular pressures? I mean, there's, there's so many, uh, I, I'm trying to think which one I should tackle first, but you know, for example, the pandemic, uh, you know, it's our, our favorite topic, right. Over the last couple of years. So we walked into 2020 thinking that it was going to be a pretty big year. We were, uh, putting our, our product finally got into Walmart. Uh, and Sam's Club and uh, all the some big, big distribution. In fact, most people in the beverage or CPG industry would say only take on one of those accounts at a time because you want to be able to service those. And if you mess it up, you're done, right? The crazy people like us, we decide, let's just go for it, right? We were ready. We had automated our plants. We were doing a lot of stuff that it ends up was super great once March rolled around and we found out that this pandemic was upon us. Uh, people heard about store shelves like uh, in all retailers, including the ones that we were just going into, 
had were being emptied. Um, there was short supply. It wasn't just plain water and bleach. It was uh, products like hemp. And so we, uh, you know, really started thinking about, okay, how can we actually, we don't know what the problems are. It ends up that there were some EDI problems. There were also some, uh, you know, electronic data trend. I think probably this whole audience that's on that watching or listening <laughs> to this probably knows what that is, but, uh, but how do we figure out how to service these customers, not just you and I, but also the stores and get the product to them. So we sort of went back to old school of just figuring out, like, let's just get trucks out to you. We'll figure out invoicing later. Uh, this pandemic will be over in a couple of weeks. I guess it really wasn't even called. But uh, then we started hearing that from the, uh, the FDA. And so we're an FDA regulated um, product. Uh, we're an essential product. Uh, it was uh, an essential product. Basically, we always thought of ourselves as essential, but we didn't really know that there was like a definition, especially when you go into pandemic status, that you have to uh, adhere to certain things, including 24 hour, um, it, uh, your plants need to run 24 hours a day. So I was interviewed shortly after that situation while the pandemic was just getting moving. And I remember thinking that there were a lot of CEOs who were calling me saying, how are you guys handling this? And all I kept thinking about was two things. How do we service the consumer and make sure that they're still getting product? And how do we keep moving forward? And, and I think that those are things, particularly with any business, right? Whether you're talking about cybersecurity, whether you're talking about uh, a beverage company or a tech company, whatever it is, that don't get caught up in the problem. Instead, figure out what the solution is. And what I've always found is that it's very rare that if you are frozen and you can't figure out how to move forward, it's very rare that that's helpful. It doesn't mean that you can't stop for a few minutes to take a breather and think, but you need to think and figure out the first steps. And that's a lot of what I you know, talk about in, in a lot of my social stuff. It's that I, you know, through my own experiences, what I've realized is that it is really rare when when you find yourself like really scared and really frozen. And I think especially when you're leading that you just can't do that, right? Instead, you have to figure out how do you continue, how do you figure out how to move forward? And I think what I realized at that point too, was that we were not only trying to figure out how do we run our plants 24 hours a day, but we had done a lot of really smart things prior to the pandemic hitting that really prepared us. And so it's something that, you know, I always share with entrepreneurs too. And I share a bit in the book, no matter what the situation is, hopefully we get rid of this coronavirus on whatever it's called over time. But I think when things are, looking good, right? You always have to be looking at how can you be doing better? You always have to raise your own bar. And so for us, putting an automation into plants, it ended up was something that not a lot of food or beverage manufacturing were doing. I mean, we were super unique. We had always believed that our supply chain should be as local as possible, as close to our distribution points as possible, because we just felt like our footprint would be less if if that was if that was the situation and um and so we we while we were trying to manage all of this and also managing employees dealing with homeschooling kids and you know reallocating jobs because things were uh we like our our food service business which is essentially our office business a lot of we supply to a lot of micro kitchen, especially in Silicon Valley, those offices were all closing. We had a direct to consumer business already set up. So we basically threw the gas on that as well. Um, but in addition to that, uh, we 
we received a phone call um, from Costco and Costco reached out and said that some of their uh, suppliers, manufacturers were not able to get the product because it was stuck in Asia. So cans pr are primarily made in Asia. And so they had heard that we do everything in the US, we blow our own bottles on the lines, we do you know lots of things that other beverage companies don't do. And uh, that's when they said, you know, if you guys can fulfill the product, we're gonna flip the switch um, on Costco. Most people would say, you guys are crazy. You should say, no, we are opportunistic. And we said, sure. We didn't know whether or not it was gonna be a mess, but we felt like it was worth the risk to be able to do that. And they were calling us and uh, they had a problem and we needed to help solve their problem for their customers. And so we grew in 2020, 40% as a company because we managed the way we managed. And I think that people, a long winded story, but people now ask like, how did you know how to manage during that time? Again, go back to the same principles of who is your consumer? What is the problem you're solving? And how do you move forward? Kara, the, 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 this, I feel like there's been a mini masterclass, you know, for, for ourselves and for our, our uh, viewers and listeners. We're, we're, um, we're running low on time. I, I, I'd love to have you on, on again in the future. I think we could probably chat with you for hours. Like, you're just so insightful. I had more questions. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so full of wisdom. Like no, away. <laughs> no, it's perfect. No, this has just been a, a, absolutely, I, this is just so insightful. Such an interesting conversation. We're really, really grateful of you taking time of your bu busy day to join us on, on the podcast today. Th thank you again so much, Kara. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. Awesome. And Chris and I will be right back momentarily to wrap up today's episode. I really appreciate Kara's authentic warmness and how she was telling her story and how she was answering our questions. You know, it was really, really, uh, you could tell her, her, her passion and energy and just, just all around positivity. Um, well, curious to your thoughts. Well, first of all, completely agree. My sense uh, in speaking with her is that it, you were actually speaking to her. It was very, she's a very authentic person. She's not projecting a persona. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I felt. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that, that, that stood out to me apart from, from her journey, um, what were the outcomes, the lessons that she, she has given us. And I was writing a lot of notes when we were, when she was talking, um, she said three things, who is your customer? Mm -hmm. uh, what problem are you solving? And how do you move forward? Those are three good things, good actionable things, good mindset items uh, for any entrepreneur uh, or business leader. Absolutely. No, and, and um, you know, if you're not following uh, Kara, please uh, be sure to do so, whether it be on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. Kara has just wonderful daily content that, that she posts, incredibly motivational, inspirational, mm -hmm. and a lot of great uh, wisdom that she has uh, learned along the way of, of, of her, her career and, and her journey. And we, we thank her for joining us today. Uh, and as well as we always extend that special thank you to our loyal listeners and viewers for joining us each and every week. Uh, if you did happen to miss a previous episode, do check out the Cybersecurity Matters YouTube page or on your favorite podcasting platform. Uh, until next time, be well, be safe, and we will see you again on the Cybersecurity Matters podcast. See you next week.